tonight we'd like to spend most of our evening in the will of the Lord with reference to the book of Daniel. But before you turn to the book of Daniel, I'd like to call to your remembrance a little verse that the psalmist gave us, where he says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And then in Luke chapter 21, as you have turned possibly to the book of Daniel, turn on over to Luke, Luke chapter 21, where we read uh, a statement in verse 24 with reference to the Lord's announcement concerning the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., we have these words from the lips of the Lord with reference to the people of Israel. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now the psalmist has instructed us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The Lord reminds his disciples <coughs> with reference to the announcement in Luke chapter 21 that the city of Jerusalem is going to experience suppression. Suppression until a given time. And that time that's mentioned with reference to the city of Jerusalem and Jerusalem being the capital of Israel, and furthermore, Jerusalem to be the uh, wonderful capital of the returning king and monarch, what do we have before us with reference to the meaning of the times of the Gentiles? Well, there's one thing we can automatically come to the conclusion and that is, Jerusalem figures in rather prominently with reference to the program of God. And furthermore, Jerusalem is going to experience suppression until a given time. And that given time which is mentioned is the time of the Gentiles. And the times of the Gentiles happens to be a time that's going to come to an end. Now all of these things we can more or less deduct from this simple statement in Luke chapter 21. Now as you look on the chart, you will notice right at the top of the chart the title of the times of the Gentiles. Then you'll notice a red arrow over on this side and a red arrow over on that side, which as far as the chart for illustration purposes is concerned, gives to us quite a span of time, which is included in the times of the Gentile. Now tonight, I'd like for us to look at the Word of God and see what we can discover with reference to the meaning of the times of the Gentiles, with reference to the characteristic of the times of the Gentiles, and the length of time as far as the gen times of the Gentiles are concerned. So in order to do this, I think it would be best for us to begin in the second chapter of the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, first of all. <coughs> now, without reading a number of verses before us in order to save time, because we have a lot of ground to cover tonight, most of you are aware that Daniel chapter 2 gives us the event of Daniel as one of the young Hebrew boys, along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who have been taken captive through the Babylonian captivity of Israel. And chronologically, we're right here at 
this point as far as our beginning is concerned. And that Daniel and his three friends, through a number of events, have been classified along with the wise men as far as the Caledonians are concerned, or the, or the kingdom of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And so he's called in all of his wise men, astrologers, and soothsayers, and has demanded of them the interpretation of the dream as well as recalling to mind what the dream is. And the men remind him, well, now you tell us the dream, King, and we'll tell you the interpretation. And uh, the king gets a little bit wroth here. And he said, listen, unless you tell me the dream and the interpretation of this dream, your head's on the block. And they reply, there isn't a man in all of your kingdom who is able to comply with the, with the request of the king. And so, in his fury, Nebuchadnezzar pronounces the sentence of death upon the whole, as we would call it, kit and caboodle of the wise men in his kingdom. Well now, Daniel and his three friends are classified as being in this category, and they are under the impending death of the king. What would you do with such a prospect? If you knew tonight that you were under sentence of death, and the date of execution was in the morning, what would you do? Well, I imagine most of us spend quite a lot of time in prayer, don't you? That's exactly what Daniel and his friends did. And the next morning, Daniel, through a number of events, has an audience with the king. And it reminds the king, he said, now listen, king, there's a God in heaven that reveals secrets. And he will tell you what these things are. And so I'd like to begin reading with verse 27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Now you will notice immediately we are introduced to the significance of of this dream as far as God's unveiling it to Daniel right here. And it relates to the latter days. Things which are involved with reference to a time period in the latter times. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came unto, my, unto thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets hath made known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not, not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for thy sakes that shall make known the interpretation of the king, and thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Now then it begins. Thou, O king, sawest and beheld a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron, part of clay. Thou sawest tell that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. <coughs> then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like this chap of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smoked the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, this is simply the dream. And this is the very thing that Caledonian magicians could not do. But you see, now you have a supernatural background. You have a supernatural platform come into play to simply give to this king, King Nebuchadnezzar, the dream that he had that night as he slept. 
Now then, here is a very interesting thing which transpires and follows hot on the heels of the dream, and that is the interpretation. And it's always good, isn't it, to come to the Word of God and find that the Bible itself interprets for us the very meaning that we are to glean. And here it is. This is the dream, and we will tell thee the interpretation thereof before the king. <coughs> Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given unto thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Well, now that's not hard to understand, is it? Daniel simply reminds Nebuchadnezzar that as far as the dream is concerned, this great image of a man, which was terrible in form, to be sure, but he says, listen, the interpretation is that you are the king, and a king, if you please, that is a sovereign king over the complete civilized area of mankind at that time. Now that's all we're doing. In other words, we're introduced to the Babylonian kingdom right here. And as far as this dream is concerned, it's in the plan and the program of God that Nebuchadnezzar should be a ruler of the earth. And what time is this? Listen, it is right here when the southern kingdom of Israel has been taken into the Babylonian captivity. Now notice the import of this particular dream as far as the interpretation and the beginning right here. Now, Jerusalem has been sacked. Jerusalem has been destroyed. And there's been three deportations of the children of Israel, Judah, into the Babylonian captivity. And the wonderful, glorious city of Jerusalem lies in ruin. Now then, here is a pronouncement that the Babylonian is the one who is going to be ruling all the earth at this time. This includes, of course, sovereign rule then over what group of people? Over the Jews, isn't that right? And so here we're beginning now to see that God is unveiling political authority that is to be superior and is to be in the place of supremacy and lordship over the children of Israel to say nothing right at this point with reference to the city of Jerusalem. Now let us go on, having made that introduction. In verse 39, And now after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. <coughs> now you will see that we are having <coughs> synonymous meanings as far as king and kingdom. A king in these areas is referring to a kingdom. <coughs> And after the Babylonian kingdom, there's to arise another kingdom, you see, that's inferior. Well, in the rest of this verse, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And so, as far as our illustration, you see the mountain of gold, the kingdom of battle. You see the mountain of silver, the kingdom which followed hot on the heels, the media of Persia. And then the third kingdom, which is to rule over all the earth, the Grecian kingdom. Well, now let's go on. But we have another part to this great image and a different part of metal. And the fourth kingdom <coughs> shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron it breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now this fourth great kingdom, which I believe was introduced by the Romans in 146 B.C., 
One of the things which characterizes it, it has a character of strength, doesn't it? Iron. It also has a character of destruction. It also has a characteristic that it's very loosely knit together. That men are going to mingle themselves together, but they're not going to be able to cleave together. It is a time of a great kingdom, to be sure. A mighty kingdom, yes. But there's going to be tremendous looseness, and there's not going to be agreement, and men are simply not going to get along. Now let's go on, beginning <coughs> with verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Now here we have someone else coming into play. Bless your heart, we've had the revelation of kingdoms, kingdoms ruling, but then these kingdoms which rule upon the face of the earth and have supremacy over the Jew, have supremacy over the land in which the Jew lives, it's going to come to an end. But as far as the revelation which we have here, it's only going to come to an end when I read in light of verse 44 that the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. And this time of great, great world rule, and who are they? They are Gentiles, isn't that right? They're not Jews mentioned here. There's the Babylonian kingdom, the medo persian kingdom, the Grecian kingdom, and the kingdom of which uh, Rome introduced. They're all Gentile powers. And the Gentile powers, or the times of the Gentiles, the times as the Gentiles rule upon the face of the earth, they're going to rule, if you please, until God decides to set up a kingdom on earth. Now listen, man isn't going to change this. Man is going to have anything to do with it from the standpoint of changing. God is going to change it. And I'm told here in verse 44 that the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom, and notice what it says, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom which is going to follow the times of the Gentiles is a kingdom that's going to be permanent. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, none whatsoever. Not, not other than the people of God. No, God's people are going to be there. And, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now you can see as far as the kingdom that God is going to establish, it's not going to be like the kingdom of the times of the Gentiles at all. None whatsoever. It's going to be entirely different. In verse 44, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. I wonder if you would stop for just a moment and drink deep. The last statement of verse 45. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Now, who do we have on the scene? We have the man of God, Daniel, isn't that right? And he's telling the king, that which is absolutely certain and that which is absolutely sure. But do you know something? There's a lot of people today come along and says, I'm not so sure. I'm not so certain. Now, I do not know your position. I've got a good idea what it is. But as for me, I do not intend to give ear to anyone, regardless how pious they may be, or how much of a scholar they may be, or lack of scholarship, sincerity, I don't care how sincere they are, if they suggest something for me other than that which falls in line with what the Bible calls certain, absolutely sure, I'm not going to believe it, regardless who they are. Now, these things are going to be true until God does something. But God is going to do something. God will set up a kingdom contrary to our amillennial friends. 
Now, another point for you. Did the Babylonian did the Babylonian kingdom come on the scene? It did. Did the Medio Persia come on the scene and go off? It did. Did the Grecian kingdom come on and go off? It did. Did the Roman kingdom come on? Yes, it did. And it's blossomed into pretty much of a worldwide thing today. Listen, folks, if we have and we can stand right now and every secular history, and I don't care whether they're believers or unbelievers, the unbelievers will vouch for the fact that these were literal kingdoms that ruled the then known civilized world. The pagan people will agree to that. What are they agreeing to? They're agreeing to the literal accuracy, if you please, of the Word of God. And if we have the literal accuracy, as we stand right here and can look back in the shadow of history and see how literally accurate God has fulfilled His Word up to these points here, you think God is going to change it? We can rest on the same degree of accuracy with reference to the future of this particular prophecy mentioned here in Daniel chapter 2. To me, it's the silliest, most juvenile, ignorant thinking in all the world to suggest, yes, we can agree to the literal accuracy of the past, but we can't agree to the future in the very same statements of God in the very same chapter of the book. It is ridiculous. But that's what's being pawned off in the so-called Christian world today. And people will sit under that stuff day in and day out and Sunday in and month out and year out. And year. I don't know what's wrong with people. I'll tell you, prejudice is a terrible thing. Custom is a terrible thing. It really is. Habit is something which is terrible. Oh, but I'm used to doing this. I'm used to doing that. Friend, I hope you will simply listen to the truth of God's Word. And if you're used to doing something against God's Word, that you permit the Spirit of God Tenderly, but very forcefully. Shake some spiritual sense into your heart and your life. And let the Lord of glory set you into the highway of his precious will and in the place of the truth of the word of God. But if you continue to go on and say no to the word of God, say no to the Lord in light of the accuracy of his book, friend, you're not fooling anyone. You're just laying up for yourselves a tremendous haystack of worthlessness. To be regretted throughout all of the ages of eternity to come, that is, that is, if you know the Lord, you're saved. Oh, folks, I can't not emphasize enough the necessity today to stand against all odds, to separate yourself from all of that kind of thing, and to be found in the place where there's faithfulness to the truth of the Word of God. Now, I mean that sincerely, and I would be a false preacher of the Word of God if I didn't say it. Because, listen, God says it, we must believe it. Now then, let's turn to a companion passage in the Word of God, to Daniel chapter 2, and that's Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Remember, Daniel chapter 2, you have King Nebuchadnezzar having the dream. When you come to Daniel chapter 7, <coughs> you have Daniel, the man of God, having a dream. God has unveiled the truth in the Old Testament through various ways and means. One of the ways and means that God reveals himself in the Old Testament happens to be through visions and dreams and trances and so forth. And this is the area of revelation that we're considering tonight. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told us some of the matter. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the, stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Now you'll notice there was an amazing thing with reference to this kingdom here. Here this kingdom is typified as a great lion, a great ferocious lion that flies with wings. Well, he's a plucked lion. And he's not only a plucked lion, but he's a changed lion. He stands upon the feet. 
There's a great change that takes place with reference to this particular kingdom. And I believe this has reference by and large to the change that came about over Nebuchadnezzar. I think we'll see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven someday because I believe he got converted. And number five, and behold, another beast, a second like a bear, and it raised itself up on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and they said, Thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Here you've got the lopsided bear that has come upon the scene following the Babylonian, uh, Babylonian kingdom, devoured much flesh, and yet the Medes went off the scene and the Persians became the prominent one. That's the reason for the two peaks on the silver kingdom, a uh, silver mountain there, because first it was the Medes and then the Persians. It was lopsided in its uh, authority, and finally the Persians pushed the Medes out. And then in verse 6, After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads and dominion, was given unto it. Here you've got the swift, jet-propelled flying leopard that flies through the then-known kingdom as Alexander the Great swept through the then-known world. There's a young, young man's age, around 30-some, captured the entire then-known civilized world. And there we have the great Egyptian, uh, great uh, Grecian kingdom. And you'll see this leopard has four heads. You'll see the four peaks of the, uh, of the brass mountain uh, or copper mountain. And this represents the four heads of this fast flying leopard, which speaks to us of the four, uh, four generals upon the, uh, after the death of Alexander the Great. Then the Grecian kingdom was divided among the four generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucia. And these four great generals, they fought and vied for the uh, Grecian kingdom. This, of course, weakened it politically and militarily, and that's the reason the uh, Romans in 146 B.C. could come in upon the scene and take it over. Now you have number se in verse 7, the matter of the fourth, fourth great beast. After this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stomped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, <coughs> and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Judgment was set, and the books were opened. Here you have much of the same that we have in Daniel chapter 2. However, there is a difference with reference to the vision. Nebuchadnezzar, as he had the dream, he, he uh, viewed these things from a human point of view in light of the great power and the prestige of man. The gold, silver, the brass, the iron, and the clay, which speaks, of course, of power, of might, of prestige. But then when the man of God views the kingdoms upon the face of the earth of which the Gentiles are in power and rule over the children of Israel and, and the whole sway, then of course the man of God through the eyes of God sees this in its beastly, beastly character. And so this is the difference. But I'd like to come now to what I believe to be a fuller interpretation of this fourth kingdom, which is the kingdom of that we are interested in tonight, primarily. Beginning with verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the vision of my head troubled me. And I came near unto them that stood by me and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. The great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. But, <coughs> now notice something here. This is most amazing. Notice what's going to happen to these four great kings kingdom. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom 
and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. My, I'll tell you, it's one. There's going to be a change one of these days, but the change that takes place when it does come as far as the reign and the rule upon the face of the earth, and that's our main consideration tonight, it's going to take place when God intervenes. And when the saints now are suffering so much, the saints will suffer far more in the tribulation period, yet there's one of these days when the saints will reign, the saints will have a kingdom, and the saints will be at peace. Now notice verse 19. It says, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stomped the residue with his feet. Now you'll see this fourth beast is a terrible beast. He is uh, pictured as a vicious thing. He devours, he destroys, and he stomps. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellow. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Now I'd like to stop with verse 20 and 21 for just a few moments, and let's go back and take a look. Of this fourth kingdom, of this fourth beast, you will note that there are ten horns. Ten horns. Now these ten horns, as we're going to see right down in verse 24, the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings which shall arise. You will note that this interpretation of the ten, of the ten horns typified by the ten peaks which are before you here. Now look. As far as this kingdom is concerned, this beast, as it comes upon the scene, with all of its dreadful character, it has the ten horns that are spoken of after his characteristic of verse 19. Now the reason I make a point of this is because of the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, which is a good commentary right at this point. Although John, in Revelation chapter 19, sees things from just a little different point of view. But the point that I want you to see <coughs> is that from John's point of view, when he said, these ten have not come yet. From John the Beloved's point of view, when he saw the Revelation, and in Revelation chapter 19, as he's standing right about here, the ten kings, the ten horns, were not in existence then. Maybe I better prove that. As you're standing and you're sitting there looking skeptical at me, aren't you? All right, that's fine. We'll stop at this point and go back and look. Uh... Beginning with verse 10. There are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have not, have received no kingdom as yet. From John's point of view, John's point of view, the ten kings of the ten horns on the beast that he sees, they haven't received any kingdom as yet. They weren't in existence. They weren't in power at that time. But they'll receive power as kings one hour with that beast. And listen, when they receive their power to reign, it's when that beast comes upon the scene, the man of sin. That's when they receive their right to rule. Now let's go back to Daniel chapter 7, continue on, and uh, note some of these interesting things. Now these ten kings come upon the scene 
at a later time, the latter part of the time. When, if you please, the one that displaces the three comes in upon the scene. Now notice this, if you will. When does this one great horn come up? What does it come up? It comes up when there's ten in existence. Isn't that right? But he doesn't come until there's ten in existence. That's right. He does not come upon the scene until there are ten in existence. Now, the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation does not bring to our attention the destruction of the three. We have to get that from the 7th chapter of the book of Daniel. But the ten horns that are in existence, and they are in existence, then one horn comes up and displaces three. But listen, those ten have got to be in existence before he comes. Now, I don't know how far to take this. I really don't. I haven't really thought this too far through because I, I don't want to be teaching heresy. And uh, uh, I know right now I'm on ground that's... Uh, that strongly debated with me. But I strongly hold to the position that this seventh king that Daniel that John holds, the seventh kingdom, is made up of the ten kings in the tribulation period. And they come to the fore and have their foreshadowing in the last part of the church age. And then when the man of sin comes upon the scene, he carries on a real political uh, conniving when he comes. But then he displaces three. And I still think possibly some of our discussion with Brother John uh, uh, Seton uh, may have some merit. I think possibly the three that he deposes is the north and the east and south. Now that's just thought. That's not dogma yet. But um, <clears throat> here you have this man. Many have asked the question, who is the man of sin? All right, now by virtue of what we've discovered right here in the book of Daniel, and that these ten kings are kings that are involved in the Gentile reign of life. Isn't that right? They are the Gentiles that reign upon the face of the earth. All the way back here, we're linked right together with the times of the Gentiles. And the times of the Gentiles do not cease until the Lord comes. And that man of sin isn't taken care of until the Lord comes. Who is he? He's a Gentile. He can't be a Jew. Then you stretch of the imagination. He's a Gentile. He comes out of the Gentile powers. Oh, I guess he could be as far as a nation, uh, national uh, uh, one is concerned, but he's certainly one that's a terrible persecutor just of the Jews. In Revelation chapter 12, and it seems so uh, incongruous with me and my thinking that the man of sin would be a Jew that persecutes Jews, carries on anti-Semitism. And that's what you have in Revelation chapter 12. Seems to me that he's got to be a Gentile king. Now, furthermore, <clears throat> when he comes in upon the scene, he is going to be one that is greater than all of them. Now, this also refutes an idea that's propagated by many, and that the one that uh, I'm thinking of right now, I'll not tell you his name, but he has stood right here in this pulpit in days past. I've had a little encounter with him, uh, not personally, but by tape. And he goes to all ends to prove that the man of sin is Judas. How ridiculous. How ridiculous. It's impossible for him to be Judas because in the first place, Judas was a Jew. Isn't that right? He was from the Jewish family. And this man of sin here that comes in upon the sea comes out of the Gentile power. Yeah. Now then let's notice something else here that's a little bit interesting as we go on. And uh, uh, 
You'll notice verse 21 now. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Now you can take your Bible and put right here in verse 21 the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation. And you find in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation where the man of sin is given authority and a great power and he gives it to the, to the beast and the false prophet and so forth and they make war against the saints and they prevail against the saints during this tribulation period. Yes, they do. Now then, let's go on. Now then, he prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Now don't you see the validity and the truth of the first night we were together with Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, how God brought to our attention right back there in the beginning of time that there was to be a great conflict. And the chief characters of this conflict, number one, was the Lord and those aligned with him. Number two, Satan and those in league with him. And here you have the conflict right here. But also you have something else. You have the great conquest. You have the great consequences of that conflict. Granted, there's going to be many a saint martyred here. Listen, I believe this that as the church was brought in by the blood of the martyrs, the church is going to go out with the blood of the martyrs. And I believe uh, many of us, well, I, I can assure you that those of us taking the uncompromising biblical position that I do, that we're going to be some of the first ones that go off the scene. When the evil forces come in in such a way that it's going to be a great delight to persecute the saints. And we have absolutely no right to plead with God and ask for a reprieve because the household of faith is simply not doing its responsibility today. You and I are not living as we should for God. We're not living our lives out. We're all involved with the things that we want to do of things that we can gain and building up our securities. I'll tell you, that's the silliest thing in the world. Do you know what we're doing today? Building up securities. Should communism take over? And got a good chance of doing it. You know what you're doing? <laughs> you're just building up a bank account for these commies. It's all in the world you're doing. Because they'll take every blessed thing away from you and they'll say thank you to you and then slit your throat. All right. Think it over, folks. We better have a real revival of the responsibility of the believer and get on with God's job. But, let me tell you this, even though they take care of us in that way, there's victory, glorious victory. Now the saints are going to possess the kingdom. All right, let me begin reading now with verse 23. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and tread it down, and break it in pieces. And the ten kings out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. See the order again. The ten first, then the other shall arise after them. He shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And boy, he shall speak great words against the Most High. Shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into the hands his hands until a time times and divide into times the last half of the tribulation period but the judgment shall, shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end and the kingdom dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him here too is the end of the matter as for me, Daniel, my cognition, which troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Listen, you'll see the reaction and response that this man of God had in his own life when God unveiled to him what was going to take place. It wasn't something, and he said, oh, I just had a hallucination. It was a bad dream. Now get up and take a walk around the block, and I'll be fresh as a daisy and forget everything. No, sir. Why, when God unveils to you, when God unveils to me, 
the response that we ought to have with reference to this plan and this program is granted to be sure that the Gentiles are going to have supremacy over the Jews. But believe me you, there's a time coming when God's going to change things. But listen, folks, listen. The Gentile powers, and we're Gentiles, absolutely right. But the Gentile powers of this world, the way in which they operate, we as children of God have got no right to embrace the philosophy and the standards of this godless cosmos world. None whatsoever. And yet, what are we doing? Gold really speaks, doesn't it? Silver really speaks, doesn't it? Brass, the iron and the clay. <laughs> these metals and these materials, they go into making up the great war, war machine of this world. Stockpiles of atomic energy means whereby we can blow one another to smithereens. Power is measured by virtue of the biceps of military strength. Politicians kick our boys around. I'll tell you, it's a godless world in which we do. And I, for one, want to say something. I don't believe we've got any right as believers to try to compete in the area of power, in the area of prestige, and in the area of possession, which characterizes the Gentile world. Do you remember what our precious Lord has to say through the Spirit of God? Not by might nor by strength, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. For we are mighty through pulling down of strongholds through the Word. And there's only one thing that's going to change a man or change a woman or change a young person or change a child. And that is the power God has decided to use. And that's his message. When is the church of Jesus Christ ever going to learn its lesson? For by grace are you saved. And that not be so. It is a gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should burn. And since we've been saved by faith, the just shall live by faith. As ye have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Listen. The times of the Gentiles characterized by a sense of value, power, and prestige of this world had its beginning in the chastening of God's people because they turned their back on His Word. And because of that pitiful, pitiful spiritual display of the children of God, God permitted in His sovereign plan and program to deal with mankind upon the face of the earth and let the Gentile world flex its godless biceps with its own type of philosophy and so forth and rule and will rule to displace God 
until God says, the cup of iniquity is full. And then, the ancient of days, the eternal one, the sovereign, the omnipotent one, called in the second chapter of the book of Daniel, a little stone. He's going to smite. That's right. He's going to smite those ten kings. He's going to smite those toes. The ten that have been reduced to eight by virtue of the Antichrist displacing three. And it says that the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold will become as a chaff of the summer threshing floor and the wind shall blow it away. That is what will amount to all of the sense of values under the roof of the Gentile vows. Coming to an end. Now let me ask you, what is your occupation in the day in which you live? Are you so occupied with that area of meaningfulness of Gentile authority as a believer in Christ that you're letting fame displace the eternal things? Are you letting the gold, the silver, the power, the prestige, and promise displace a life of dedication, submissiveness to the Word and the will of God, and a life living in those white robes of pure white linen, the righteousness of God, and walking with a life saturated in this book and submissive to the heart of your God by virtue of a life of faith, trusting, resting, Placing your whole being upon this which unveiled him. So this becomes a channel through whom and through which you have him before your gaze constant. <laughs> In fact, I'll dare to try something, and that is simply take what you are, what you possess, and I mean take your job, take your securities, Take your family, I mean it, all closest relations, and say, all right, God, everything to the side, I unreservedly trust myself. of the family. You will see the meaningfulness of that walk of life should God lead you in to a secular area. You'll be able to realize then the securities you have are not yours, but you're a steward. They belong to God. 
But don't try to stand back and say, Now, God, look what a great thing I am, and I'm doing you such a great favor by squeezing out a little what I don't want. Folks, I'll tell you, you're going to spend an eternity of regrets and a present life of absolute worthlessness. But all this, it comes first of all. Having trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Being willing to do what Luke chapter 14 with reference to being a disciple means. That nothing can come first. That He is Lord of all. Because remember, the incentive that you have is that that very one who cared for you there so you can go to heaven is the one who will end all of this thing one of these days. And it would be wonderful to be on the winner's side. And from that time on, to see the glory of it all. It's the poorest business deal in the world to spend three score and ten years and leave out eternity. Instead of investing three score and ten years in eternity. Now then, what is Jesus Christ to you? Just a little stone. A little stone can be kicked around picked up as a little boy with his slingshot, whirled into the air. When I need him, yes, I'll, I'll come, but not before. The little stone in comparison to the gold, to the brass, to the silver, to the power of oh, Jesus Christ. Now, he can't. Compete today. I'm not trying to put on, and I'm not trying to hurt you. But, folks, listen. If that little stone is eclipsed, by the sense of that, you're losing. You're losing. Such a loss. It can't be measured in time. And it's costing you peace, right? let that little stone tonight in the hands of the Spirit of God smite that ignoble image of your life and let him blow out all that yours first. You have it first place, including my desire, my life. Take it, Lord, so it'll be safe. Take it, Lord, in the pathway of experience, so it'll mount to something. 
molded, Lord, around yourself so that I'll not be a stranger when you beckon me home. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the blaze of his glory and his grace. Try it. You'll never turn back. He's precious. Now our Father, it's your word, not ours. It's been such a blessed privilege to fellowship together. Father, we're so convinced that in the areas of evangelical circles today that the Lord Jesus Christ is looked upon as a little insignificant stone compared to all of the values of this life. From the world's point of view, the Gentile philosophy. Gracious Father, may that not be the case for any precious person here tonight. But should it be part and parcel of their daily experience in all honesty and sincerity, as they permit the Spirit of God to take inventory and probe the depths of that heart, Father, in the quietness of these moments, may they permit the Spirit of God to mold and to form that heart around the Lord Jesus. May there not be some false profession or wishes or wish to be this and having good intentions, but Father, may there be the reality of the life in action that's conformed unto Him, whereby the Spirit of God might continue to conform us unto Him according to the divine purpose and program of your gracious heart. 